thanks to everyone for joining us today. Let me get my slides going. Um, it's UC Berkeley and Working Partnerships for commissioning this research um, to forward for funding it. I have to say, it, you know, as a researcher, we're often behind the scenes, like fiddling with things, and um, it feels really good to have research that is finding some relevance and some traction um, in, a, in the larger debate, as I think this one has. And I really credit the, the vision of Derica and Aneta um, in, in teeing this up and seeing that we really needed uh, an alternate uh, approach to understanding technological change at this moment. So, there is a seemingly endless stream of aggregate studies that examine how susceptible to automation any given industry or job is. And to differing extents, all of these studies suggest that over the next 20 to 30 years, widespread job loss is coming. Warehousing uh, is one of the industries that's predicted to be transformed by these changes, by automation. You hear in the press, um, they, they talk about impending dark warehouses, um, and they're dark because there are no lights on, because there are no workers in them, and they might be filled with the kinds of robots that we see um, in this video. Um, the technology is often framed as helping workers do their jobs better or more easily. And so the question is in warehouses, could technology be a win for everyone? Could it make manual jobs better? Could it achieve more efficiency? And could it do so at lower costs? And so a central question of this research was, what's gonna happen over the near term, over the next decade, our actionable future? Um, does the increasing use of technology represent a win-win proposition? Uh, the short answer to that is uh, no, not without proactive measures. We found that over the next decade, job quality, that's, that is the conditions under which workers show up and do their jobs every day, is likely to change and could become significantly worse. And this is in an industry where I was talking to a supply chain analyst yesterday. Um, he was admitting to me that um, the jobs are already pretty miserable. So in the, for, in the foreseeable future, this, this question of job quality is a much bigger issue than job loss, despite the hysteria about mass unemployment due to automation. The most likely scenario for, for warehousing facilities is not full-on automation, so not dark warehouses, but partial automation and labor augmentation with potentially negative effects on job content. A key feature of tech change will be variation, and that ha that's going to happen across firms, within firms, and across technologies. So it, it'll, it'll, it will depend on the activities occurring in a warehouse, the amount of goods being moved, the product markets in which the firms are competing. So for example, um, it's much easier to find a technology um, for a warehouse that's moving a smaller variety of goods or for um, one that's moving similar goods like an apparel warehouse. Firms that are at or near the leading edge of technology in one area might be lagging behind in other areas. I talked to a, a major parcel company um, that had made huge investments in these automated scanning and sortation systems, uh, but we're still using Excel and a whiteboard um, to schedule their workers. Um, and across technologies, um, it, it, variation will occur because um, technologies tend to be very specific um, for particular warehouse activities. So what we have is a set of factors pushing toward technological experimentation and a strong set of factors pushing against. Um, and we're gonna get into those a little bit later, but, it, but for these reasons, um, we don't believe that dark warehouses are around the corner. So rather than widespread automation in the near term, increases in the pace of work, processes of de-skilling jobs, and new forms of surveillance and algorithmic management are poised to undermine working conditions. The impacts of, of potential declines in job quality will be very uneven. Workers of color make up 66% of frontline warehouse workers, despite only being 37% of the overall labor force. Black and Latinx workers in particular will bear the disproportionate brunt of, this, of change. And the leading edge um, of this change is really being driven by e-commerce. Shifts in consumption patterns have reverberated through supply chains and Amazon's really playing a substantial role in remaking the competitive dynamics. So um, this research follows in a long history of in-depth industry studies that examine at close range the dynamics that are shaping industrial change. We conducted interviews with um, dozens of uh, warehouse operators, industry analysts, people making decisions about which technologies to either develop or implement in facilities. And we were driven by three main questions. 
First, what key industry dynamics are playing a role in technological change? Second, how will adoption of new technologies impact warehouse facilities, operations, and the industry as a whole? And third, how might adoption of new technologies impact jobs in warehousing? So we're gonna begin in the here and now with a little bit of background on the industry. Um, warehousing is an often overlooked industry, but it really forms the backbone of the US economy. Most, almost everything we buy passes through on, at some point. The industry employs just over a million workers in the US, which is a conservative estimate. Um, but these workers are involved in the storage, flow, and rerouting of goods through physical buildings, big, massive buildings, for the most part. Um, workers in the five largest occupations make up the vast majority of total employment in the industry. So this is three quarters of all the workers are frontline workers in largely manual jobs who are moving goods, who are picking things up and, and moving them. And the table at the bottom here um, shows employment in, in these five largest occupations and median hourly wages on the right. Um, because of the way data is collected on the industry, this is probably a, a pretty generous um, estimate of average wages since it doesn't include um, temporary workers in the industry. This slide is just another way to look at warehousing work and trends over time. So this chart shows employment in blue and wages in red from 2001 to 2017. And the thing to note here is that inflation adjusted wages in the industry have actually fallen since 2001. And they saw their most rapid decline in the last few years at the same time that employment rose sharply. And so it's counterintuitive. Usually when employment demand rises, our classic economic models predict that wages will rise too. Um, so it suggests that in this industry, there are other dynamics that are shaping wage levels. But the takeaway here is that wages have stagnated for nearly two decades. The warehousing industry itself as a whole is responsible for the efficient calibration of goods production and consumption, so of supply and demand, which is obviously a critical component of firms' competitive strategies. Uh, but it's been a laggard industry in terms of technological adoption. Um, this is for a few reasons. First of all, um, very narrow margins in the industry means that it's highly cost sensitive and focused on containing costs. Um, second, this financial conservatism results in risk aversion, where firms try to avoid taking on risk altogether or shift it um, onto other companies, such as subcontractors. And because of this, outsourcing is a prevalent practice across the industry, and outsourcing dynamics have tended to slow the process of innovation. Finally, uh, this industry in the, is the, in the midst of substantial change wrought by the rise of online shopping. Uh, which has introduced a whole new set of dynamics that warehouses have to contend with. On the one hand, we have a very labor-intensive process of e-commerce order picking. On the other, um, we have the need to compete with Amazon's ability to deliver quickly, which has shaped consumer expectations across the board. So you see Amazon having widespread effects both across the retail and logistic sectors, and companies are kind of caught. Um, they need to move more goods more quickly, you have labor markets that are tight and workers are hard to find, but technology investments can be risky. And so it's leading firms to ask, um, do we experiment with new labor strategies or do we invest in new technologies? Um, so e-commerce is clearly a major driver of the current phase of experimentation, but it's only one of many factors that are shaping firms' decision-making. I referred to this a little bit earlier and it's one reason we think that automation is not imminent. So we have one set of trends on the left here, um, tight labor markets, rising real estate costs, and the speed requirements of e-commerce are all pushing toward technology adoption to meet these new demands while containing costs. On the right-hand side, we have this set of constraints, and these are the set, this is the set of trends that's really pushing against um, and effectively slowing the process of change. So you have vast variation in the industry, the types of products being moved, the kinds of activities occurring in warehouses, um, really sharp peaks and valleys in demand. Um, one manager I talked to uh, who was running a, a home improvement re, um, distribution center said, find me a technology that can handle a bag of plaster of Paris, a jackhammer bit, a garbage can, a saw blade, and a bucket of paint. And his point is, it doesn't exist yet anyway. Um, there are other factors that are pushing against tech adoption, though. Outsourcing, which disincentivizes technological investment, the inertia of the status quo, sort of the way things have always been done, and the rate at which technologies are being developed, which is a little counterintuitive, 
Um, but it complicates decisions about when to invest and which technology to invest in. So given how quickly technologies are advancing, you know, the question is, well, should we wait for next year's model or maybe wait for a price drop? And so it's, the, it's this sort of um, chicken or the egg. Um, so all of these factors collide uh, on, a, on the shop floor and have to be taken into account uh, when considering new technologies. Speaking of which, we are now going to take a crash course in warehouse techs. Uh, two buckets, software and hardware. We're going to start with software. Um, so warehouse management systems, are, it's the most widespread technology in warehouses. It's a software system that controls and coordinates all of the processes from receiving goods into the warehouse to figuring out where to put them to, to um, coordinating the assembly, the order assembly process. But as an indication of the unevenness um, of tech adoption across this industry, a full one third of warehouses don't have a WMS. Um, and without a WMS, you can't really implement other technologies. So you already have a third of warehouses that are sort of waiting uh, and using Excel, relying heavily on, on Excel still, um, and, you, and you can't build any hardware applications on top of it. Um, labor management systems are an add-on to, to WMS. You have to have a warehouse management system in order to have a labor management system. Um, and it increases the capability of managers to track and allocate workers. They typically also include um, engineered labor standards, which, is, which are the, um, the set of productivity metrics that workers are held to. Increasingly, artificial intelligence is being incorporated into these WMS systems, which are effectively automating little bits of work, like deciding where goods should be stored based on how quickly they move or how popular they are. Um, and it's possible that warehouse operators are gonna focus on making incremental changes to the software instead of, in lieu of, um, making larger capital investments in hardware over the short term. All right, we're gonna run through a list now of the, um, the leading, some of the leading technology, the hardware applications. So this is an RF scanner, radio frequency scanner. It's it, uh, one of the most common hardwares you find in a warehouse. It's used to manage inventory and to track order picking and productivity. So this, this is a worker like scanning a barcode. That's the whole point of an RF scanner. This is a conveyor. These are, these are sort of old, <laughs> quote unquote, old timey. They've been around, you know, the last say 20 years in, in warehousing, sort of the last um, wave of big uh, technological change. But they're these large scale systems, they're bolted to the floor, they're largely inflexible, um, but they, they're really good at reducing the need for walking across warehouses, which tend to be these vast um, cavernous spaces. This is voice directed picking. Um, so these are pretty popular systems where the worker uses a headset. Um, and gets instructions about where they should walk and how many things to grab, which items to grab and how many. Um, but, but note here that this system um, is really effective also at cutting a worker off from anyone around her since it's constantly talking to her um, and asking her to um, respond in some way. Um, goods to person systems is sort of a, a broad category that can take many forms. On the left, we have um, Amazon's Kiva robot, which is this little Roomba type robot that picks up a shelf and brings it uh, to a worker, to a worker's picking station. On the right, we have a hanging bag sorter, um, which is a very similar idea that the pouch comes to a worker who stands at their picking station um, and, and reaches in and, and grabs items. Here we have an autonomous mobile robot. Um, these are automated carts that travel around warehouses. They move items from different stations, so from, a pick, from picking to packing or to sorting. Um, robotic picking, this was a similar, um, in, the, in the beginning, the video I showed, that was a robotic stacking or, or palletizing, but um, it's the same idea. This is really the holy grail uh, in warehousing, um, but the technology really doesn't deal very well with the variation I was talking about earlier. Um, so it uses artificial intelligence and a sort of a gripper hand like this picture shows um, and tries to figure out how to pick up uh, different items. And when the robot fails um, and it can't figure out how to grasp an item, there's a team of humans tucked away off site um, that can come in and um, basically teach the robot manually how to pick up that item. So it turns out that artificial intelligence sometimes relies on intelligence that is not so artificial. Uh, sensors take many different forms in warehouses, but this example um, here is called a smart belt. Um, it's, a, it's a belt that a worker wears that dynamically tracks the micro movements of a worker uh, for health. This one is for 
ostensibly health and safety purposes. And finally, we have autonomous guided vehicles, which are basically automated forklifts um, that pick up and carry uh, pallets around a, a warehouse. So with all of that in mind, um, the dynamics of the warehousing industry, the factors pushing for and against tech adoption, and some of the leading technologies, what direction are we heading? We're heading towards changes in the quality of jobs in warehouses. First and foremost, we're, we're likely to see work intensification. Um, as I mentioned early, uh, earlier, warehouse work is hard on workers' bodies. And there's a potential for some of these technologies to reduce the most arduous activities that workers are doing. So the walking, the lifting, the twisting, and so on. Um, so that potential exists. However, our research found that um, those gains are likely to be canceled out by increases in workload and the pace of work. And these speed ups really occur through two different processes. The first one is reinforcing workers' productivity by constraining human interaction um, and through the ability to micromanage workers at a very minute scale. So that voice picking system that I talked about earlier where the worker has a headset on, um, that cutting worker off, the worker off from their coworkers is one mechanism through which um, technology is being used to focus workers' attention on their productivity. The second is the use of algorithms to govern the sequencing of order assembly and the picking rate. So these are systems that track, analyze, and inform workers about their performance, measured either against um, engineered labor standards, these metrics, um, or against their coworkers. For example, um, Amazon has this game called Mission Racer um, that turns the order picking process in, into a game in which you're competing with your coworkers to see who can work the fastest. So I'm just gonna give one example of this. The, this is that hanging bag sorter that I mentioned earlier. It's called a Joey pouch. Um, and so you, kinda, you can picture kind of a dry cleaner setup, but on an industrial scale. Um, each bag holds one item and it's delivered to a workstation um, where a worker is standing. So the system effectively removes walking um, and can actually reduce exposure to other ergonomic risks. Uh, it also serves to track very closely the productivity of workers and paces their work by constantly delivering pouches to the worker at a defined rate. The second change is, uh, is de-skilling. So de-skilling is a process of taking a job and um, dividing it up into its you know, constituent bits and figuring out which of those, those bits, those tasks, you might be able to either simplify and or apply a technology to. And so when you simplify a task, you um, expand the potential workforce that can perform that job. For example, you might be able to hire temporary workers because you've removed any need for familiarity with a warehouse. It also shortens the training time because the job is simpler, um, and it, so then it reduces your turnover costs. Um, so for employers, it's a pretty clear win. For workers, uh, it could mean lower wages and more churning through temporary work opportunities. And the example here is our friend Chuck, the autonomous mobile robot. Um, so these robots lead workers across the warehouse. They, it, they pace them as they walk and pick items. And it really simplifies the order selection process. Um, so here the system has, has effectively removed all decision making by the worker, how to get to the right aisle in the warehouse, which shelf the item is on, so on and so forth. And so by simplifying this process, an employer can bring someone in off the street virtually tether them to this cart and away they go. Uh, the third bucket of job quality change is surveillance and algorithmic management. So algorithmic management is introducing new forms of workplace control where the regulation of workers' performance is granular, scalable, and potentially relentless. And this is new. Uh, we've, you know, the ability to monitor workers' precise movements at scale is something we have not um, been able to do before. Um, there's very little transparency into what data is being collected on workers, for what purpose, and how it's being stored. And there's no transparency into the software rules that are managing and governing um, workplaces. And so we'll come back to the, the smart belt um, I mentioned earlier, which can track location and motion data and then um, gives managers a, a dashboard. That's what we're looking at here is the sort of dashboard of data that a manager would look at. Um, and its current use is for health and safety to sort of make sure workers are within um, common sort of ergonomic standards for each, uh, each task they're doing. But you can pretty easily imagine it being used to track worker productivity at a really incredible uh, level of detail. 
So what we see here is the conditions of work in warehouses um, heading toward more rigid forms of monitoring and management. And the application, when we have the application of technology to social environments, things get really tricky where, where a human might um, exercise empathy or discernment um, in a situation on the job. AI is not trained to do that. Um, in fact, an algorithm is, is trained to do the opposite. Um, so workers report that it's demoralizing and stressful to be governed um, and possibly fired by an algorithm. Uh, and it really raises questions about data privacy uh, and ownership. So there are clearly a number of unintended, unintended consequences that could result from all of this. Damage to employee morale from toiling under increasingly inhospitable conditions. Uh, work intensification could lead to overwork and burnout and thus increased turnover, um, which would exacerbate the challenge of finding and retaining workers in a tight labor market, which every warehouse operator I spoke with said this was one of their major challenges. And so, you know, when we assume that streamlining a process or applying a technology to it leads in a very linear fashion to greater efficiencies and cost reductions, um, this assumption, it, it might be fundamentally flawed. Um, together, the changes in job content and working conditions raise serious questions about health and safety. Warehouse workers um, already experience injuries at a rate twice that of other private industries. It's, that's higher than construction, coal mining, and most manufacturing jobs. Um, so workers are already, are, are already at risk of in, injury, but when you add increased workload and speed ups to the mix, the potential for health and safety risks increases. Some of these technologies are really testing the limits of the human body and the long-term physical and psychological impacts are very poorly understood. For example, what are the impacts on mental health of working under constant stress to hit productivity go targets governed by algorithms? Uh, the impacts of all of this change will be felt unevenly. Older workers may find it harder to reach productivity targets. When productivity is tied to merit pay or bonuses, this could be de detrimental to their overall earnings. And new technologies might be more intimidating to older workers who haven't encountered computerized systems, say in school or earlier in life. Uh, women are more likely to work in e-commerce warehouses than they are traditional warehouses, which on the one hand means they have expanded employment opportunities in what is a traditionally male-dominated industry but there are wage penalties for e-commerce workers. Some occupations make more than $2 less per hour than their counterparts in traditional warehouses. And there are increased scheduling instabilities because e-commerce volumes are harder to predict. And I mentioned early the, um, that warehouse workers are more likely to be Black and Latinx. They're also more likely to be male and young. Workers of color are overrepresented. 66% of frontline workers are workers of color. Uh, and, and this means that communities of color will disproportionately bear the impacts of unknown long-term health and safety consequences. Some occupations are also more exposed to change. E-commerce order pickers will likely experience work intensification, de-skilling and surveillance. Um, and to a lesser extent, or um, we'll see shipping and receiving clerks and even some management positions may see de-skilling and automation of some of their tasks. Finally, warehousing is an industry that's uh, concentrated in particular clusters outside of major population centers where these impacts will be felt most acutely. So on the periphery of Los Angeles, Chicago, New York, and Dallas, Fort Worth. So the good news is uh, workers aren't necessarily doomed um, and none of this is inevitable. Uh, I'm, I'm not here to lay out a policy agenda. We're, we're not there yet. Um, and I think Derica can probably talk a little bit more about that. But I do think we can um, seek out some principles to guide the path of technological change. And first and foremost, um, we have to find ways to include workers in processes of technological implementation. The only real model we have for this is collective bargaining. Um, and in an industry that's 94% non-union right now, um, this presents some challenges. So in addition to expanding worker organizing, what other models can we be developing to formalize the process of workers having a voice on the job? We have to very carefully track the physical and psychological impacts of new technologies and create feedback loops so that um, as we're learning what those, what those impacts are, they don't end up getting um, you know, reproduced in new technologies that are being developed. 
um, you know, outside of the context of some enforcement mechanisms, though, um, this is a really difficult thing to make work for workers. Um, and finally, uh, we need to develop some regulatory guardrails to ensure transparency um, of the software rules that are governing workplaces and to protect workers' data. And I think we're starting to see this in the consumer realm to some extent. And so we have to figure out a way that that, that all bleeds over into workplace privacy as well. So technology is not inherently good or bad on its own. Humans create tech, we bake our biases in on the front end, and then we can exercise choices about um, how it actually gets implemented on the back end. So none of this is predetermined. Uh, warehouse operators stand to gain substantially from tech uh, advances. And the question is how these gains are going to be distributed. So we really have to start now. It's urgent um, to avoid a win-lose proposition where short-term benefits are captured by the industry and the long-run costs are borne by workers. <laughs>